Hi, I'm Sam Jeffrey, a Commercial Director at Norwich City. I'm going to be answering some of your questions today. Craig Thompson asks, what are the ongoing plans with regards to city stand redevelopment? I think it specifically references Fulham and Liverpool in the question. What I can say is that we have contracted with a recognised international consultancy by the name of Legends. Legends actually work on, have worked on the Liverpool and the Fulham examples that are cited, along with a whole host of other international projects at the Burnabout, the New Camp, uh, Leicester City in the UK, Twickenham, etc. And, and absolutely one of the most respected in the business. So those guys are working on an outline business case for us at the moment, at the first stage of that being um, the structural feasibility. Uh, does it technically work? Can it physically work? Once they've completed that, they then move on to uh, the business case effectively. How much money can it make us? How quickly could that money be paid back? And ultimately at the moment, architects are working on some plans about what that could look like. So hopefully there's uh, an update in the near future. Our preference, I, get, I think specifically in response to his question, would be to extend up over the city stand. There are challenges with regards to the road and current infrastructure but that would be our preference if it's feasible. The Norfolk Sonic asks, what are the club's plans with regard to safe standing? So safe standing has always been high on the agenda for the board and, and that remains the case. Um, the recent trial uh, within Football Stadia with regards to safe standing has probably led to some longer lead times than initially would have been thought. It's, it's not quite as straightforward as just putting safe standing in. There are a limited number of suppliers in the industry. There's a significant uh, price increase with regards to raw materials. The price of steel, for example, at the moment is absolutely astronomical. And there's lots of clubs now in the mix looking to, uh, to, looking to put in safe standing. From our perspective, from a Norwich City perspective, it's certainly, as I say, on the agenda. Um, fans might have noted at the end of last season in the fan survey, we included a question with regards to safe standing. That was a really positive response, over 80% positive um, from the sample size uh, that, that responded to that. That sample size, however, was relatively low, uh, probably only 10% of season ticket holders, but a great start, a great start. It's clear that initial uh, uh, feedback is strong, but actually more consultation is required. So there'll be a load of in-person consultation uh, in the coming months. Once that is out the way and hopefully, uh, again, re re very successful, then we would move on to consulting those that are specifically affected uh, and specific regions of the stadium that would be affected. And all being well then, if it continues to be positive, we'd be looking to make a decision probably in the next 18 to 24 months. Tom Hughes asks, is there any scope for a fan-led kit design process? Well, that's quite tricky uh, for a number of reasons, particularly on the home shirt. The kit design process is quite a long process to start with. It's probably worth explaining. Um, and it's a pretty delicate balancing act between what looks good and what will sell well. A theory of that is the hope, hopefully, what looks good will sell. But everyone, of course, has an opinion on that, and that's, that's their prerogative and, and, and that's their right. Um, the home shirt, with regards to our budget, takes up or makes up about 80% of sales. So the home shirt effectively makes or breaks the budget uh, and therefore is relatively uh, sacrosanct. Um, the process, it's probably worth explaining, as I said, is, is a really long one. So the shirt we launched recently in July, that was conceptualised back in May 2021, so way before um, it was launched. And that kit design team is, a, is an eclectic team. It's made up of males and females across the wider commercial department. Some are fans, some are Norwich City fans, some aren't, to ensure that there's, a, you know, there's a, a good structure there in terms of opinions. And that process, as I said, starts in May. There's some cons concepts put together. Um, largely, we like to stick to probably three types of shirt in a cycle, um, whether that is a truly bespoke design, whether that's a retro type design, or whether that's a classical design. And you can look back on our recent shirts and you'll note that. The first promotion season under Daniel Farker with the, uh, with the retro flex on the shirt, with the first season of Daniel Farker in the Premier League then with the fade up, with more of a bespoke design, and the first shirt uh, in lockdown was more of a classical design, um, albeit, unfortunately, probably not quite as successful as we'd hoped, given that no one could see it in person or, or go and feel it in person. Those concepts are then sent to Joma. Uh, Joma are a brilliant partner of our football club, and one of the key reasons we partnered with them, and not, frankly, an Adidas or a Nike, is that there is a significant amount of creative control. Joma will have some say, um, but largely we like to believe we've got a really firm relationship, a strong relationship with those guys and prove that it can be successful, led by the club. And ultimately the concepts we've sent to them will, for want of a better term, be, be Joma-fied, put into the, um, the specific 
pieces of material that are available that year. And there are, there are, there are numerous, it's not quite as narrow as, as I say, working with a Nike and Adidas, but it's not endless. So there are considerations then around the designs we've put in, can they, can they work in, in the Joma format? Largely, certainly in the first two shirts we, we've launched with Joma, that has been the case and it's been really successful so far. Once that, uh, that conceptualizing work has been done from Joma, the design team then heads out to there, probably lock ourselves in, in a room for maybe three or four days, working on three or four concepts for home, three or four for away, and then a couple for, for the third shirt as well. We bring them back, we then present to the executive committee on it, we then present to the board on it, and ultimately then we pick the shirts that we want. That process lasts until around September, October time when we submit our order for the number of shirts we want for the following season. That then leads to a delivery of May the following year, so that's probably a six month lead time there we're looking at. From the turn of the year, the marketing team then ramps up its activity with regards to the concept on launch and works uh, close in hand with the videography team on that. It's worth noting that uh, at this point last year, that's when the marketing team presented the opportunity uh, and the concept of the mental health awareness video, which I hope everyone would agree was a universal success and hopefully has, has changed people's lives uh, for the better. So a long-winded answer to the question is, on the home shirt, it really wouldn't be possible. Um, but actually, from an away or a third shirt perspective, there being slightly less pressure on sales, I think that's probably something we would be open to. Uh, and we want to work closely with Joma on that. Uh, and actually, there's probably a really nice fan-led competition or initiative or working group that, that can come together. It's probably a case of watch this space. Andy Pearson asks, what's the latest on the colony developments? Well, the good news on that is that the latest uh, stage of the Lotus Training Centre development begins on Monday the 25th of July. We expect the completion towards the end of 2023 and this is the continuation uh, of a brilliant piece of development work over the last few years to, to really upgrade uh, the Lotus Training Centre to be what is effectively now a top 10 facility in UK football. Most players now, I think certainly most new signings, new players that walk through the door there will be blown away by what they've seen. I know Gabriel Sara, uh, having signed from one of the biggest clubs in South America, was absolutely blown away and impressed by what he saw when he signed. And uh, it's an exciting development that will be finished towards the end of 2023. Ben Seeger asks, what due diligence was conducted prior to partnering with Scallop? And then a wider question with regards to the impact of partners on fans in general. Well, I, th I, th I think talking about that, the, the most important thing to open up with is, with regards to the commercial partnerships, it would be remiss of us as, as a commercial team not to firstly assess all opportunities that come our way. Now, some of those are rejected out of hand immediately. For example, if there was an opportunity to work with a Russian bank right now, of course that would be immediately rejected. Um, but if the opportunity that's presented to us or that we have in, indeed ourselves uncovered um, is deemed to be worthwhile exploring, then we'll do so. And then it becomes down to the I guess you'd say the sliding scale of commercial opportunity versus risk, almost risk versus reward. It's probably worth noting at this point that the more debatable, uh, controversial industries are the ones that pay the most, uh, whether that's gambling or cryptocurrency or fan tokens. They, they are the more lucrative opportunities. So that's when it, that sort of sliding scale is, moves up and down and actually becomes, I guess you'd say, slightly trickier um, to make a decision. If we then get to the stage where we believe that it's an opportunity we should continue to explore, we'll then conduct uh, a thorough due diligence process. That's from a PR standpoint, a legal standpoint and a financial standpoint, e.g. what is the reputational risk, if there is indeed any, um, what are the financial implications, can the company pay its bills for example, are they at credit risk and what are the legal implications, are the directors who they say they are, um, do they have anything that would um, prevent us from working with them. And look, it's, it, it's not a foolproof process that happened last summer. I think we can all reflect on that. Uh, mistakes were made and, and we tightened our processes on that. But even some of the biggest footballing organisations on the planet, City Football Group, for example, have made mistakes in this field and had to reverse decisions on some of their partnerships. But we'd like to think now that our processes are, are very, very tight and, and it's a wide range of people that are aware of all, all, all deals that are done before we make a final decision. And it can be quite subjective. There are cryptocurrency investors out there. There are social gamblers, I guess you'd call them, people that um, have an accumulator at the weekend or, or uh, have a bet at the races. Um, Stuart Weber and I were, were recently out in Brazil uh, meeting Sao Paulo and Curitiba and, and Brazilian culture is, with regards to fan tokens, is very positive. Um, uh, so 
and, and, and that is an industry in the UK which is obviously incredibly, um, is viewed incredibly badly, uh, certainly by the fans. And, and I'm happy to say that we, we have explored that as an opportunity. As I said at the start, it, it, we have to explore all opportunities. Um, and and a, a leading, I guess you'd say, fan token provider made a huge offer to us, a huge offer to the club. But actually on that sort of sliding scale of risk versus reward, revenue versus values that we believe in, well, there were some questions that we weren't happy, we, we didn't believe were satisfactor satisfactorily answered um, by that brand, so we haven't partnered with them. It's worth noting that if we are working with, let's just say, some of the less popular industries, um, we, we're very strong with those partners that there could be no explicit calls to action. Bet here, invest here. That, that, that doesn't align with what we want to achieve. Uh, with specific reference to Scallop, as Ben asks, um, we were comfortable with that, that Scallop did pass all of our relevant due diligence processes. And Scallop is a blend of traditional financing, I guess you say, sterling, the dollar, etc., and cryptocurrency. The uh, financial element, the traditional financial element, is covered under FCA uh, regulation by their partnership with Modular. And Scallop also uh, holds a full EU and Canadian license, so, so we were comfortable on that. But again, as, as I referenced before, there were no calls to action on it. This was a particular, a particular uh, partnership around brand building for Scallop, and we were comfortable in the end. James asked, was it a difficult decision to stay with Lotus on the front of the shirt? Have we seen an upturn in shirt sales? and why would you partner with a betting partner on the front of the shirt? Well, first off, uh, it's important to say Lotus are a brilliant partner of this football club. Um, Matt Windle, the managing director there, and his wider executive team, all brilliant friends of our club, been hugely supportive of everything we've wanted to do over the last few years. And actually, you can even see it in the shirts we've launched uh, in the last few weeks. Lotus decided and were happy to change their Roundel logo to the word mark so it fitted better with the shirt. They were happy to change their brand colours so the gold would feature on the ruby shirt. It's a brilliant, brilliant relationship and, and we're really proud to be working with them. But it's worth noting, as I said in one of my previous answers, that we have to assess all opportunities. Uh, it would be almost commercially irresponsible not to do so. So the previous deal with Lotus on the front of the shirt was a one-year deal. So there was uh, a requirement for us to go and assess the market to see what other opportunities there were that were out there. And there were some opportunities, uh, specifically within the betting space. And these opportunities, uh, derived a higher uh, partnership fee, as is the case with industries such as betting. However, we believe this was the time, and this was a, a board decision, a club-led, a club-wide decision, that this was the time to almost self-regulate when it comes to betting on the front of our shirt. So, uh, certainly of the club in its current structure, we will never again have a betting brand on the front of our shirt. Um, we, we're really keen, we always had a, an interest in working with Lotus, we weighed that up against a, a significant betting offer, and we believe this is the right time to self-regulate with regards to betting on the front of the shirt. So commercially, th there was a decision to make. There is a higher revenue derived from, from betting on the front of the shirt. That is in the hundreds of thousands in the championship, but it's almost certainly in the millions in the Premier League. And whilst there would certainly be an upturn in shirt sales, we've certainly seen that with, uh, with the new shirts we've launched recently, they don't outweigh the potential loss of revenue with regards to uh, having a front of shirt betting sponsor. But it goes back to that original point I made the values versus what we stand for uh, and the revenue that can be derived, well, our values stand for more. Um, and, and we're proud to say that we will no longer have a betting partner on the front of our shirt, certainly under the current structure. Jess asks, what has the club actually done to integrate the women's team? Well, the answer to that is uh, we've done an awful lot. Um, we're really proud to as well. Um, we've hired Flo Allen as our new general manager. Flo is a brilliant individual, um, former professional footballer uh, for Bristol City. Uh, excellent background, she knows the industry inside out, she's an absolutely wonderful person to have around the office and extremely talented. The women's team have been integrated as a department much like uh, the academy or the regional development programs with marketing support, communication support, etc, HR support. Uh, I'm pleased to say actually uh, in the last few days we've just concluded our first sponsorship deal for a five-figure sum uh, with a big local business as well as doing a deal with Nuffield Health, who are actually partnering also with the, with the women's team with the Euros on at the moment. So this is, a, this is an area that will go from strength to strength. Flo is a brilliant person to lead it, uh, and the women's team certainly fully integrated in the club. Owen asks, are members of the commercial team football fans? Uh, he, he mentions that he, he thinks that fans are often treated like customers, and specifically, I think, in this case, referencing the Marseille game being £10. 
Um, on streaming, uh, I guess the best way to uh, talk through how we come to those prices is, is based on two factors, the opposition and the quality of product we're providing. So the Marseille game is against Champions League opposition, multi-camera feed, broadcast quality, uh, and that was priced at £10. The Cambridge game, £5. It was a one-camera feed, so less production quality. Celtic game, at £7.50. So, so there's some logic behind that scale. Uh, and I guess the reference from last season is we, when we played Gillingham, uh, we charged £5 for that game. So, so there is some logic in it, and it's not just sort of plucked out of thin air. Circling back to the question, are members of the commercial team fans? Well, the commercial team, there are, everyone is a football fan, certainly. Some are Norwich City fans, some are non-Norwich City fans. I guess you'd say they're professionally Norwich City fans, because all we do, all day, every day, is try and grow revenue streams that, to assist Norwich City. And, the line self-finance is, is rolled out very often, um, and we understand that. But, but it's something that certainly within this club and definitely within the commercial team, it's something we're incredibly proud of. We know that our job makes a genuine impact uh, on the future of Norwich City Football Club. Um, it's like we're quite open in saying that as a commercial team, we don't make any commission. So we don't do our jobs just for cold, hard cash. We do it for the betterment and the pride and the professional pride that, there, that comes with working for Norwich City. Th that isn't the case at a lot of other clubs. Um, a lot of the clubs, established Premier League clubs, clubs with owners with bottomless pockets, well, actually, commercial revenue is not quite as important. And Norwich City is unbelievably important. For every 100, additional 100 grand we find, that might be a new piece of analysis equipment that the first team can use to help analyse a game that ultimately makes us better for the next game. We might win three points on our charge back to the Premier League. And for every half a million pounds we find, that might be the fee to sign an academy player, um, like Liam Gibbs from Ipswich. Or for every million pounds we find, additionally, that is the wages of a player, of a first team player for a year, for example. So, um, harking back to the original question, we certainly don't want to treat fans like customers, but the job that we're trying to do is grow revenues as much as possible to help assist uh, in the continual growth of Norwich City Football Club. And, and we don't work in isolation. Certainly the bigger decisions that are taken are widely taken across the club, uh, looking at the wider financial uh, implication of those, the broader financial landscape, whether that's across the senior leadership team, the executive committee, the board, certainly the, the bigger decisions that have been taken in the last year or so, whether that's season ticket pricing, brand evolution, um, mental health awareness video, have been broadly consultative across the club and actually also uh, with the club's official supporter panel to make sure that everyone has had uh, a say on, on the decisions that are taken. Cameron asks, what does the partnership with Curitiba actually do? Well, you can certainly be forgiven for thinking this might just be PR guff. Actually, it's far, far more than that. There's a huge opportunity to work with a brilliant club uh, in Brazil, and we're really excited about what the future can hold there um, from a football and, as importantly, from a non-footballing standpoint. The partnership came about at largely uh, on the back of Brexit, and Stuart and his team had identified that some of the previous markets in which we'd previously worked, second division Germany, second division Spain for example, were no longer going to be possible as a result of Brexit. So South America became a region that was of interest um, and, and has gr gradually grown over the last two to three years. Now with two full-time scouts, two full-time Norwich City scouts based out in South America. Myself and Stuart flew out to Brazil a couple of weeks back to meet with Curitiba uh, as well as Sao Paulo to conclude the Sara deal and the guys at Curitiba are incredibly excited to work with us as we are to work with them. We took in a couple of games, took in some academy games, uh, can certainly reveal that we will bring three Curitiba uh, academy players on trial in the next month, which is a really exciting development from a footballing standpoint. Um, from a non-footballing standpoint, it's going to be a great relationship. We're going to be retailing some shirts out in Curitiba, which is a great opportunity for Norwich City, a club that plays in yellow and green, to retail some shirts in a country that plays in yellow and green. There's a big opportunity there. We will also be uh, doing the same uh, at Carrow Road and online and at the Fan Hub. From a retail perspective, there's wider uh, discussions ongoing with regards to tours and friendlies. Uh, and, and generally, this is, this is a, a partnership that will grow and grow and grow and, and ultimately could be a game changer for us. No surprise to note there were many questions with regards to investment, American investment, etc. So I can provide an update on that. And the update is that some months back, uh, Michael Folger approached the club um, with the intention of looking to sell his shares. He felt the time was right after 25 years to effectively pass on the baton uh, in that regard. 
And Michael deserves huge credit, huge credit, because he's served this club amazingly for the last 25 years with dedication, with personal investment and personal finance, and he's done a brilliant job. And it can't be understated the importance and actually the significance of Michael allowing the club to sell his shares or at least assist in the selling of his shares. He could have gone independently on that. But as always with Michael, he's got yellow and green in his blood. He wanted the best interests. He certainly has the best interests of the club at heart. Um, and that was a really significant moment. When Michael opened the door to that conversation, the process was taken up by Stuart Webber, sporting director, Zoe Ward, executive director, and obviously on the board as well, and Anthony Richens, the finance director. And they've moved quickly on that to interview a number of potential uh, purchasers of those shares. And the club expects the sale of those shares to be concluded in the coming weeks. And we're really excited by the potential additional expertise that we'll have coming onto the board as and when that time comes to pass. Thanks for all your questions today. I hope they provided a bit of an insight into the commercial workings of Norwich City Football Club, particularly at this busy time of the year. Sorry I couldn't answer all of them, but hopefully it's given you an insight into how we work.